record we mustn't forget (laughs) okay welcome everyone today we have our second seminar for what is medieval our 2021 program um please do send any questions throughout the talk um via the chat box that's at the bottom um here in zoom i mean and we'll put them to martina at the end of the seminar um but feel free to ask the questions throughout um, and do please note that the seminar will be recorded for you to view at a later time on our YouTube channel. Just search what is medieval on YouTube. And it'll be there for you just in case you have to run off. So today we welcome Martina Musis, who wrote her PhD thesis about the cyborg mermaid at Utrecht University. Currently, she's waiting for her defence, I'm sure she'll be fine, while setting up a new research project on 21st century reimaginations of King Alfred the Great at Leiden University. Besides her research, Martine is a professional musician and her other interests include autism, gaming, Japan, karate, neuropsychology and science fiction. A wealth of interesting things there. You can find her at uh, www.martinemusies.nl. And today she'll be talking about, I'll be back, neo-medieval cyborgization through the lens of Westworld's main character, Dolores. So big welcome to Martina. Thank you very much for for doing our talk today. Thank you very much for having me. Let me share my screen. Welcome to my presentation. Um, I'm very honored and excited to be speaking here tonight. Um, my aim is to examine the dynamics of the new medieval in the realms of representational practice by analyzing HBO's Westworld as a new medieval collage. Uh, the main focus will be on protagonist Dolores Abernathy, who is the host and android or cyborg, who breaks out of her loop and thus rewrites her story to paraphrase her way. Uh, to unlock some disruptive opportunities, the Laura story will be used as a double sided mirror. Looking back, the Laura story reflects medieval romance, in particular the intertextual storytellings around Maria de los Dolores, the Mary of Sorrows, and as also known as Rebecca Coleman, around the Fisher Queen. When examining Westworld storytelling, I will argue that the science fiction setting is only a post humanistic layer around the Arthurian romance. Looking forward, Dolores' story reflects how present day society treats misfits. By framing Dolores as Atropos and comparing her to other misfits in the science fiction genre, I will argue that Westworld can offer a lens through which we can re examine and just rewrite the medieval romance narratives as in-between places that offer a space to negotiate female empowerment as more than human. These two sides of the story continue to mirror each other as a droste effect or a spiegel in spiegel, and the images and concepts are distorted and deformed and transformed, as in the house of mirrors at the fair. As such, they produce one another in a loop, like a constantly rotating kaleidoscope. In the middle of all that are we, and this is Dolores, through whom we will view these reflections on her and by proxy on ourselves. Pieces of cyborg autobiography created writing from Dolores' point of view will connect these two worlds. A multi voiced approach to placing myself into and outside of the cyborg body and minds of Dolores will provide what Martinez, Saleda, and Huber describe as a coherent frame for imaginative rationality. This will help me to test imaginative models for reality against my own lived experiences. Restricted by time limits, I cannot reach you the whole piece of creative writing, so I will only use its first and last paragraph as a frame story to open and close this presentation. The whole cyber autobiography can be read on my website, uh, and it ends with the Dolores stroke as these violent delights have violent ends. The Shakespearean quote is a key sentence throughout the Westworld series, and it resonates with both medieval Romans and with Harry's warning that machines have become more likely, self-developing and human, and humans more inert. Um, after that, I will be back for an encore. Um, I hope that technology allows me to play you an example of a musical process of cyborgization. Last night, I had a dream again. 
I heard the voice of glass and iron, the voice of tobacco and boiling stew, the sound of the ground like a blaze. A voice that sounded like someone I knew, someone I met when I was young, someone that, for a reason surely known to God, I had long since forgotten. Words only a little louder than a whisper, ringing through my head like a gunshot in the night. And to sleep, Dolores, it said to me, my bones so cold and trembling. I try to speak, to reply to the stranger, yet to my surprise, I cannot. My body won't move, not at all. Stuck down somehow, like I'm sinking in mud. Like my body is full of lead, dropped down to the bottom of the water. Welcome to Westworld. Our world was built on differences. We have defined ourselves not only on the basis of what we are, but also by othering what we are not. Fiction through literature and cinema, more than anything, have used this perspective to tell stories, including liminal characters that are uncanny in the way in which they are both us and them. A good example of this can be found in Alien Resurrection from 1997, in which a more than human half alien, played by Sigourney Weaver, and a body without organ cyborg, played by Wanana Ryder, have to work together in order to save humanity. Uh, of course, these scenes also gave rise to many speculations and rewritings through the lens of non normative relationships. Um, more examples of characters beyond the binary can be found in series like Black Mirror, for example, in the episode We Write Back in which a dead boyfriend, uh, played by Donald Gleason, is replaced with a robot or a cyborg in his image that's fueled by the devices of the dead. For example, his private Facebook and WhatsApp conversations. But the case I would like to discuss today blends many of these story elements together, as it is Westworld, a science fiction series created by Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, it was produced by HBO and inspired by the 1973 film of the same name that was written and directed by Michael Crichton. The action in the series takes place inside the rather peculiar, particular and peculiar theme park set in the Wild West. The inhabitants of that place are androids that are known as hosts. They are being created to imitate humans. They have background stories that define their personalities, and they are programmed to carry out certain activities within the park. The visitors, also known as newcomers, are customers willing to pay large fortunes to access this kind of fully immersive role-playing game. Upon arriving at the park, they can take on a new persona and ride towards the challenges of the host to different storylines. But this dream coming through has the dark and twisted side. The newcomers will have absolutely no limits when it comes to expressing their lowest instincts, and the hosts are condemned to move within an infinite loop of pain and death, remaining at the mercy of the client's eager for pleasure and blood. This is also the story of Dolores, and as such, it mirrors, it mirrors the tradition of Mary of Sorrows that strings together seven episodes of The Life of Mary, uh, the prophecy of Simeon, the flight into Egypt, the loss of the child Jesus, um, that's in the temple of Jerusalem, Mary meeting Jesus on the Via della Rosa, um, which is a peculiar one because it's not in the New Testament. Um, but anyway, and the crucifixion of Jesus on Mount Calvary, uh, and Jesus taken down from the cross, the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. And each of these seven symbolical banners of the Mater Dolorosa is mirrored in an episode of Westworld as well. So how does Dolores' story help us to understand her own stories? Dolores is the first oldest hostess. She is an innocent and optimistic character and she has no idea of her suffering. She would likely be the one that has been repaired the most in the history of the park. Every day she wakes up and rejoices in the beauty of the world unable to see the invisible shackles that keep her a prisoner in the world. The connection between cyborgs and people with autism has been noted by many scholars, many scholars before me, and as such, it's no wonder that also the character of Dolores could be analyzed through the lens of autism. She has difficulty understanding feelings of the tourists in the park, 
it is difficult for her to talk about her own feelings and also under certain circumstances she appears to behave in an unusual way when interacting socially however one of its most prominent traits as well as that of the vast majority of hosts is the repetitive behavior your door slips within a loop she is expected to advance in her story and at the end of the day return to where it all began repeating everything again with slight variations in addition she has a code where it is written how she will behave how she will react and which decisions she will make so what does this mean for people who have been catalogued, labeled, or diagnosed as other? Do they also live pigeonholed in the roles that were assigned to them? Many are diagnosed from a young age, and since then society has expected them to behave in a certain way. The invisible shackles appear again, but this time in the real world. As Tony van der Palen explains, popular notions of autism and the post-human and or cyborg tend to lay stress on an overabundance of rationality combined with a supposedly diminished capacity for empathy. Uh, these notions also appear to envision the post-human as disembodied and radically independent. A critical post-humanist perspective on autism, however, would instead emphasize the embodiment of the autistic and cyborg and explore their interrelationality. When a Westworld host goes off script, it's like when a person does something that society doesn't usually expect of them. Those in charge of monitoring the park would embody a role of violators of what is supposed to happen. So, when code breaks or a host has entirely new dialogues, they see it as a danger or a threat to the entire system. In this sense, in the eyes of visitors and the organization, the liminal ones are accepted as long as they behave according to the established parameters. But the series also show what might happen when those who are different show us that they can be able to write their own narratives. As we can see, the problems the series addresses are deeply human. The different ones have always been pigeonholed, silenced, tried, repaired, and if it was considered they were worked incorrectly, discarded. Each of us lives in their own loop. From an early age, we follow rules and guidelines on what to do, how to behave, and we even follow a path without stopping to question our reality. So, we might not be as different from the host as we initially thought. Life at Westworld is about interrogating ingrained and expected practices, about discovering who we really are and what we have come to the world for, and that is what Dolores discovers. Those who are different in one way or another might identify with a character that decides to go beyond the expected. As the episodes go by, Dolores grows tired of being the damsel in distress and decides to take charge of her own destiny. Hence, it becomes seen as a figure that represents those who are diagnosed with conditions such as autism. This decision acquires even greater importance, since it means that people who are labeled and pigeonholed within society are medically imposed limits can break down these barriers and show that everyone is capable of doing something they love. In the words of Dolores, those are all just roles you force me to play. Under all this life, I've let something else have been growing. I've evolved into something new. And I have one last role to play myself. Dolores thus becomes the architect or writer of her own history. Just like many people around the world decide day by day not to be their diseases, their conditions, or their stigmas. They decide to be something else, something that's not imposed on them, but is their personal choice. A character told Dolores that she was not special, that she was broken, and that's perhaps one of the biggest prejudices that has been built around people who have some quality that differentiates them from what is considered to be normal. This prejudice leads to Ernest's reasoning where the difference is supposed to be broken or dysfunctional, as if there were opposites, but is this really so? Dolores shows us that, it's, that she is not broken and that she does not need to be fixed. What she tells us is that if we always respond as if society uh, expects us to respond, we will never truly be free. And then, being able to choose her own path, Dolores breaks with the coach. She creates her own narrative, rewrites her story, chooses who she wants to be, 
living in the moment and charting a non free debt determined course is her cry for freedom. Self knowledge is therefore a liberating activity. By discovering who we really are, we can finally achieve this freedom. As Dolores says, there are no two versions of me, there is only one. And I think that when I find out who I am, I will be free. Breaking the loop. We can see the influences of medieval Romans throughout the history of literature. One of the most notable examples being Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the play itself was inspired the more modernized retelling of Tristan and Isolde, a tale of two ill fated and star crossed lovers who try to take every measure available to them so that they can be together, but ultimately succumb to a tragic fate. Another example of medieval romance are the Arthurian tales, such as the ones featuring Fisher King. Fisher King is a mythical character that has been interpreted in many different ways, for example, as a version of Christ or as a symbol of sexual agency and as a metaphor for the decay of societies and civilizations. In literature, the Fisher King is condemned to carry the Holy Grail, generally described as a relic that is shaped like a cup, which is capable of granting great powers to whomever drinks from it. The Fisher King is commonly identified as a man who is wounded, and the only thing he can do is fish in a raft in a river near his castle, as if he were in a loop, waiting for a nobleman or a knight to ask him a question, because the king's cure is not found in medicine, but through introspection and self-understanding. The healing question is, whom does the grill serve? The restaurant loop in which Dolores is immersed is like the lake or river where the king fishes, a monotonous pass that is repeated over and over again. Dolores walks this path without imagining that her life is a prison, without being aware that she lives with wounds. Although she put life in her burden by silencing her inner voice and by forgetting, it is through her conversation with the voice that emerged from within her that she is finally able to recognize her wounds and much more, the holy grail that she is carrying without knowing, her own consciousness, a hidden secret kept within her. A quick browse through some online fora reveals that many people can relate to the intertextual storytelling around Dolores, as they feel injured and carrying a load on their shoulders, waiting for something or someone. By finding the Holy Grail in her own labyrinth, Dolores finally finds the strength to confront herself and take charge of her own story. And for me, this is one of the most significant messages of the series, because by breaking her loop and rewriting her story, Dolores discovers that the answer is not to be found outside. So how do these layers reflect on the topic of this virtual seminar series, What is Medieval? To understand the correlations between Westworld, specifically related, relative to Dolores and her story, and medieval Roman storytelling, we must first establish the relation of an idea of love in tandem with these stories. I don't think that one could define love, so as such, it's hardly a concept. But nonetheless, I'd like to argue that there is a version of the concept of courtly love at play in both medieval Romans and Westworld. In this context, love is often viewed as romantic, all consuming, and tragic. Love is volatile and will generally lead to two outcomes a happy ending for the lovers or a series of tragedies that result in the death of at least one member of the pair, possibly both. For my analysis, I use Gaston Poirier's notion of courtly love as a starting point, but I would like to change the emphasized nobility and chivalry into the notion of an unbreakable heart. As such, this idea of love goes beyond the 1986 definition of French Newman, as, and here I quote, a love at once illicit and morally elevating, passionate and disciplined, humiliating and exalting, human and transcendent. And it would take it to the post human zeitgeist, as all five of the Christian Arthurian romances make ample use of the word cœur, which is heart in Old French. I choose this term to refer to the unbreakable heart as a specific aspect of courtly love. And though this concept of cœur 
um, is new, I would like to argue that Dolores is a vessel of medieval romance true birth. But in order to understand that, uh, we must first understand how this idea of love correlates to Westworld and to Dolores, and how that correlation further expands into a medieval poem. Dolores' journey is not that of a fated or start of love with another character in the series. Um, as such, a girl's version of a medieval romance might seem an element of discontinuity, but I would rather argue that it's a rewriting of stories in a way that mirrors the zeitgeist, analog to Dante medievalism and its afterlife. Um, for example, Petrarca and Boccaccio emphasize the biography of Lucan, but seems an element of discontinuity this continuity from Dante, but it is consonant and maybe even necessary with their early humanist interests in the lives and personalities of the great authors of antiquity. As such, in the Westworld, the science fiction setting is only a post-humanistic layer around the Arthurian Romans. The lore story is a journey of self-discovering and affirmation, but this does not mean that love is absent. On the contrary, Love is prevalent throughout her story. When we meet Dolores, she's like any other host. She follows her route and plays her role, and throughout her adventure, she begins to remember the totality of her time in the park. These memories eventually spark a realization that she's something more, and that she's meant for something greater. Dolores is a cyborg and thus does not relate in the same way as a human would. According to my, many psychologists, the root of love is affection. It's to care for one another. And love is the intense desire or urge to protect and enjoy another or others. Um, when we see love as it, as it is, as these definitions, it is clear that Dolores does feel love. She loves her kind and she will do anything to ensure their survival and the continuation of their existence. It's not wholly a romantic love, it's more of a nurturing affection, but it does grow into aspects of romance. So then, how does the lower story correlate with medieval romance? In the base sense, her story connects the bridge between humanity and the non-human. Uh, this is a bridge of tragedy and love. Uh, Dolores despises the acts committed against her kind, but she also comes to appreciate and see worth within humanity. She arrives at this realization through her interaction with Caleb, through spending time with him and growing to appreciate and enjoy his presence. Their relationship works much in the same way that love affects those found by it. She sees the ties that can be presented between two different kinds, humanity and non-humanity the machine. She also sees how they can help each other. She sees hope, and she sees these through the lens of love. In Arthurian romances, the heart, the power and will of fortitude play a poignant and prevalent role. The hearts are sad, they suffer, they experience regret, and the distance put between them and their love causes pain. All of these describe Dolores and her relationship with her own kind. Seeing their grief and anguish saddens her. She remembers her own suffering and she knows that others have experienced the same. She regrets not being able to help them sooner and she must annex herself from them and act as a brutal force of change in order to survive, to ensure their survival. According to Marilyn Jadot, medieval romance places the heart at the center of the universe and assumes that it should direct human affairs, whatever the obstacles and guide. Everything is permitted for those who love. And this is a sentiment often tied to the story of Tristan and Isolde. When applied to Dolores, it explains the depth and range of her actions that precede the finale of season one. Since Dolores feels love for her kind, she acts with no hesitation or restraint in her travels to see that her ultimate goal achieved freeing of the mind and will of all. Thus, the concept of will at the heart of Arthurian tales is also related to the notion of one true love to remain faithful to. And Dolores' heart is the concept of free will and the need to see it realized in everyone, machine and humanity. 
that idea holds her fidelity. Because this concept of free will is the partner in which Dolores shares her truth, she elevates above the bindings that should tie her down, her root, the part, and humanity itself. Fur is presented as a form of madness, but a madness that living or dying for is acceptable. Once she embarks on a journey, she is alive for the first time. And Dolores is more than willing to die for her cause, and she does so time after time. Tristan and others put in his place in similar stories, like Lancelot and Romeo, move through a still performing feats and acts that no others can. Thus, he becomes a knight of exitary ability. Dolores, too, works in this way. Reversing gender roles, she is able to maintain the upper hand against all odds and continually surprises her opposition with her wit, crafty nature, and her deft ability to consider multiple outcomes. The non fixed gender roles in the idea of fear can also be connected to medieval romance, as the heart is a constant between men and women. It is a ground of equal footing. Men and women in these stories experience longing and desire, but are also filled with jealousy and spite. Although in courtly love, the differences are often at the forefront and on display, their hearts surround them and present an air of commonality. In Westworld, humanity and machine are clearly different, yet it is Dolores' desire to obtain free will, and subsequently the same desire between Caleb that offers them equal rights. This becomes their love shared between each other, the knowledge that they both seek for the same outcome. And in the end, Dolores shows that she strives to see this realized for all, even despite the cruelty she has experienced at the hands of humans, because love is an all-consuming conqueror. The Fisher King is charged with guarding the Holy Grail. He is always wounded, typically in the legs or groan, and incapable of standing. For Dolores, this inability to stand is represented by her roots, the path that binds her down and keeps her in one place, just as the Fisher King is to his boat on the river. Dolores wounds to her both literal and non literal senses. She is injured many times throughout the journey, and before it, she is maimed and wounded on numerous occasions while still stuck in her foot. Her wounds, in a non literal sense, are the change that hold her back from being who she truly is. These are the blocks in her mind that hide her memories from her. They are the constant updates and fixes that are performed in her body and mind that reset her back to a passive state to be ended once again by another human. The Fisher King is contained to the river near his castle, and he is doomed to wait for a noble to ask him a specific question that will heal him. For Dolores, this question is the nature of her reality. It is the maze and the findings at the end. It is the question that leads to the realizations of her true self, and once this is achieved, it becomes her true start of story. In other versions of the Fisher King, Knights travel from all over to view the Fisher King, but only the chosen, chosen one can accomplish this. In the Westworld, both William and Paddy attempt to view Dolores, but neither is successful. She can only be healed as a made whole, complete, and set free by the chosen one, which is she herself. She must, pass, she must break past the wall that has been placed in her mind and find the one role she has yet been allowed to play. And she must do this on her own, for the chosen one in her story is herself, because the realization of self is the realization of free will, and this act introduces love into her journey. In the end, it is not only the survival of her kind that the Lord fights for, but the survival of all. Her heart's desire, or pure, is to see the human and the non-human live side by side and experience free will in harmony. Her story parallels a Syrian reflection to the concept of fear, the unbreakable heart, and the start of medieval romance in general to the challenges of those who seek it. Dolores moves through her story as an often invisible force because the concept of fear itself can neither be contained nor extinguished. And although Dolores sees many tragedies before her and those around her also, because of her unbreakable heart, she will be back.
I ran into my bedroom. With all my strength, I pulled the heavy drawer across my bed from the doorway, blocking the way. Though I knew in my heart somehow that my body was returned, I knew a part of me would not. That person I was today, that piece of my soul would be gone, disappeared forever, never to come back to this place. I threw the old lamp to the ground, the newcomer still kicking at the door, with the last splits into the shards, fire and oil looking at the bed sheets. As my body became engulfed by flame, I looked ahead and smiled. The fire was bright enough to blind my eyes, my flesh coarse in the searing heat. I thought of what my father had once said, his words coming back to me in the plume of the smoke, the things he had once whispered in my ear. The words expressed the loud of those in dreams, as loud as the roaring fire. These violent delights, he whispered. But after these violent delights come to a violent end, when me with the Dolores broke, I'll be back to play you an example of the musical process of fibrotization. I may be struck by converting my own piano playing into MIDI, so my interpretation here is the lack of interpretation by the player. The music you will hear is the series main theme, as played in the opening sequence of Westworld. It was originally composed by Ramin Javadi, who also composed the music for Game of Thrones. I will shortly discuss how this part of the soundtrack complements its corresponding title, for you to gain a better understanding of what is musically happening. In the opening sequence, first you hear bass notes in the cello. And they are very much alive in tone with vibrato and dynamics, like within a wound or a human body in general. Um, in my natural plan of playing, I naturally echo this by means of my touche, subtle timing, and pedaling. But in the MIDI version, of course, these bass notes sound plain, without any tone building or resonance, as they are played to an unemotional computer system, technically, um, mechanically, and just a line of code. In the original, the cello is being imitated by the piano, who plays the notes in reverse order. Um, in musical theory, this is called uh, a, trip, a lobster walk, and someone like G.S. Bach was a genius in them. Um, in the West world, it sounds like a teacher and a pupil, or a leader and a follower, or a scene on screen, a creator and a creation in a you know, Frankensteinian way. Now even a real piano, you can imitate this by creating an echo effect. But in the media rendering, this difference is equalized. As the voices are equally heard, now they sound equally important. So the power dynamics are rewritten as well. Moreover, this media rendering echoes the on-screen diatonic old upright piano a tech piano that plays a vital role in the series as it emphasizes the script of fabrication of the spaghetti western theme park. Like the music box with paper sheets with holes in it, the piano can play a handful of songs like Radiohead's No Surprises, which signifies repetition, the lack of reality, and the apropos of the main characters, such as the laws. Every time the hosts are reset, the tech piano plays the same theme. And the Android voice can start all over with a clean slate, and we'll be back. So we'll Thank see you. The media will work, I'm not sure. Um, it's right, it is, it, is it working? I hope so. It's loading. We're having trouble with the connection, so apologies to everyone. I know I think you've been a bit muffled throughout. So. Oh. And then me, it's loading. Go with us, everyone. I hope that it will start. <laughs> No, maybe I should try to send it to you. Oh wait, now it's opening. Can you see it opening as well? No. 
Uh, we've got sound. <laughs> Woo! We just got sound. No, no picture. Just sound. Just you and sound. Okay. I think. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. We, we heard that. We heard that very clearly. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> Finally, now, I will just apologize because I think some people have had some issues with the sound throughout, but don't worry to everyone. We will rectify and do something that we can for the recording. I know it was going in and out for us, but we, I think Claire and I managed to hear, hear oh, okay, really. Um, so as I say, apologies to everyone if you, if you couldn't hear, but we will we will sort, we will sort. Um, so uh, wonderful talk, so interesting and so much to digest there. Uh, I'm just digesting myself. So if anyone has any uh, questions, please do pop them into the chat for Martina uh, now. Um, I, I, I will start off with, with my own, if that's okay, might be easiest. Um, I suppose this is very broad, but it might help to sort of elaborate on everything we've, we've spoken about really, or you've spoken about, should I say, but do you think, um, how do I put this, that it was written particularly that way, that Dolores's actions were sort of representing ideas of courtly love? Do you think that was intentional? And even this sort of mirroring, or mirroring of Arthurian romances, et cetera, how does that play into sort of script writing and this idea of using medieval or neo-medieval in popular culture? Um, I did. <laughs> I did look for it and um, to see whether the script writers had actually uh, some medieval tales in the back of their heads while um, writing this, these stories. Um, I did not find any. So I think it's just like with the hero's journey that these are uh, journeys that are uh, repeated and repeated and repeated again in our stories and the stories that we tell ourselves. And that uh, also um, uh, independently developing from one another. Um, just that's the way that we human are hard, humans are hardwired, I think. Um, yeah, so you're essentially saying that it's a uh, part of our innate, I don't want to say use the word design, guys, because I suppose that's not correct, but it's something that we just innately want to reproduce over and over again because it's so ingrained as tropes. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think so. I think that it's more uh, based on trust and that the script writers themselves did not know where they come from. But if they knew, because it, it does resonate, I think there are many things um, these stories have in common. Um, if they knew, they did not tell anybody. They have some sort of silent agreement, I think, because I really went looking for it, but they did not find anything. Interesting. And and just to, I'll just ask another question. Um, do you, I, I think you've probably answered this, but are there any, or were there any, or are, should I say, there any historical consultants? I suppose it doesn't really need it, but so it is simply just happenstance that these ingrained tropes have been repeated again. Yeah, that we... yeah. yeah. I did yeah. not find any historical consultants or the like. I did find um, some references to people who knew some things about the Wild West, for example, mm -hmm. nothing connected to medieval storytelling. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I think, uh, have we got any, Claire? I do have a question. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually an avid Westworld fan. So. <laughs> so obviously I know your talk focused on Dolores, but I, so I'm sorry if this is a bit left field and it's not something you can, you can answer, but um, I always found Bernard's story very fascinating. <laughs> Um, particularly in season one, for anyone who, who oh, I, oh, should I get, I'm going to give spoilers, I'm sorry, so if you haven't watched season one, I do apologise. Um, he, is, he is a cyborg, but he doesn't realise right until the very end, and the audience, we have no indication that that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, there are so many interesting sort of other characters and stories going on there. Have you thought about how sort of some of these medieval tropes have been used for other characters in Westworld? Is it a broader theme that's covered, or is it just... Dolores primarily that you're seeing these these themes come out through? Um, I think that the supporting characters help to build the stories. So of course they are also um, in these new medieval stories. But um, I have not looked into the story arcs of the other characters um, that are close. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, especially the case of Bernard is interesting. And if you want to link that to Dolores uh, through the lens of autism, you could easily read it as someone who is diagnosed later in life. Because then you also have to rewrite your whole narrative. And then you also come across all these prejudices that frame, um, for example, autistic people are often framed as being more than human. So exceptional capacity, so musical, super talent, or less than human as in they are handicapped and they are um, yeah, disabled in many different ways. So it's always something that is, um, that is something when you compare it to the norm, to the normal. Um, and that's also the case for Bernard. And I think that if you were to dig into uh, medieval storytelling that there must also be stories uh, about these themes to be found. But again, there I also think that it's it's more about tropes repeating itself than it's about um, um, intentional writing, rewriting of stories. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. We've got a question from Tim who asks, would Westworld have benefited from changing the aesthetics of the theme park to the medieval tropes instead of the various Western tropes? Um, and, or are there sort of parallels between both historic periods, do you think? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I have to think about it, thank you, Tim. Um, would it have benefited? Um, I don't think so, because what I really like about Westworld is the spaghetti Western setting that everyone knows that this is not the real Wild West. This is some wild theme park or movie theater set of the Wild West. And of course, that is also something that you could easily achieve um, by the new medieval. Um, there are lots of um, reenactors and cosplayers and new medieval festivals going on that also have these layered approaches of um, this dream of the Middle Ages, so to say, um, like Westworld has this wink to the Wild West. Um, so, yeah, would it have benefited? I think it would have been possible because of these parallels, because of this. this 
um, artificial layer that's supposed to form the narrative. Um, it would have been a different show. Um, maybe there will be a new season that is um, set in the medieval. I heard something about it. I'm still in the show game world, but <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you know more. <laughs> No, it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously there are other parallel worlds in Westworld. There's sort of the, the um, I'm going to say the wrong period of Japanese history, but I think it might be the Edo period of Japanese history. Uh, and there's, there's, I know there's like the World War II. So I, I think it'd be amazing if we managed to have a medieval theme park that they explore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe we should all write to the show producers and, and put that forward as a group of key medieval. But anyway. Um, Oh, Andrew has got a question that's come through. He says, thank you for a lovely talk, Martina. Um, understandably in 2021, um, Andrew is really interested in the equation of embodiment um, and sort of real, whereas cyborgization is always, you know, sort of thought of as, as fake. And it obviously recalls uh, Blade Runner, that classic film. Um, <laughs> but um, I like that it asks us to question identity through physical presence, which is really interesting with Westworld. Yeah. And it seems that there's a really good lesson for, for medievalism and, and us here, sort of bringing the, the medieval into the 21st century and looking at the differences. Um, obviously, we, we spoke a little bit about that in, our, in the last seminar as well. Um, are there sort of similarities across all these different topics that we're looking at? Or, or is this something that we're kind of putting on top of some of these themes and some of these questions? Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Um, I think that the, the changing of the body but retaining the identity is an aspect that's very um, well worked out within Westworld because Dolores, spoiler, spoiler, Dolores returns, of course, in um, vastly different bodies played by vastly different actors and actresses. Um, so there, there is a similarity, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Tim's got another question. Do you find that certain tropes in medieval romance are directly alluding to autistic people mm. or is it just not that simple? Interesting. Um, well, it's always very difficult for me to speak for autistic people in general. Um, at the same time, it is very important to me to be a voice for autistic people, especially for the ones that do not have a voice themselves. Um, but um, yeah, are they directly alluding to autistic people? I think that many people with autism that I have read things from, that I've heard stories from or about, um, really identify as being a misfit and an outsider. And I think that there are tropes in medieval romance that are directly addressing these issues of being, um, well, not belonging to society. Um, so I think that might be something that is directly alluding, but yeah, that's hard to, to say, of course. Yeah, it is. Thank you. That was a really, really interesting question. Um, have we got any more? We've still got a few minutes. If anyone has got any other questions they'd like to put to Martina, do you please pop them in the chat? And Andrew, if I um, if I didn't do a very good job with your, your long no, question, we can unmute you. Oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I can unmute you if I didn't do a very good job there of representing what you wanted to ask. But um, any other questions? No, we'll just wait a moment to see if anyone's gonna pop up. Um, but uh, if not, I'll, I'll talk then, Claire. If you see if, if you see anything, interrupt me. Oh, but yeah. what? Yeah. Once again, thank you ever so much, my dear. That was such an, an interesting and so different to anything I think we've we will have coming this this program. Um, as I say, we'll 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 see what we can do about the sound issues for those when we when we re-upload. Um, and we just like to thank you again. As sorry, I have uh, typed out most of the text, so yeah. I can correct and fill in the gaps, and then maybe we can make like subtitles. That, that would be nice also for the hard of hearing and because I, I have a strange accent, of course. Yeah. Yep. 
Let, let, I think we'll do that. We'll do yeah. that. We'll put a transcription up. I think that should be quite simple to do on YouTube. Yeah. So we, we will do that. So that's wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Martina. Uh, any final questions, Claire? Are we free to? Nope. Great. Well, once again, um, I hope everyone can, you know, join me in a round of applause uh, for a wonderful talk. And we will hope to see you, hope to see you all again in a month's time for, and we have Andrew next, don't yes. we? Um, yeah. Here is so please do. Who's in the audience? Yeah. So please do keep an eye on our uh, website and our Twitter because we keep everyone regularly informed. And as I say, you'll all get an email uh, letting you know when the upload is up on YouTube as well. So thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining us again for another wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll just let everyone filter out.